Ejection seats were effective escape systems in the early days of the jet age. Would capsules and pods be even more successful as airplanes reached Mach 2? We're going to find out in this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. We talked about hearing these words over an intercom. It meant that you were going to be bailing out of that airplane immediately. And this is our escape system series. In part one, uh, we covered ejection seats, the need for protecting pilots against high wind blast at high speeds. And these seats were quite uh, complicated and cumbersome. Their success rate was not that high in the early days. Today, we have systems like the modern ACES-2 and other seats uh, that uh, have an extremely high survivability rate or much simpler, much more effective escape systems for high-speed aircraft. In part two, we're going to be covering capsules and escape pods. As airplanes reached speeds of Mach 2 in the mid and late 1950s, uh, such as the North American A3J Vigilante for the Navy and the Republic F-105 Thunder Chief for the Air Force, the need to protect pilots during bailout became much more important and much more complicated. Here we see a uh, pilot figure in a Republic F-105 rocket seat. This was a zero-zero seat that was capable of uh, successful ejections from the ground <clears throat> up until the 40,000 foot range and at speeds as high as Mach 2. But it was risky. The pilot was exposed and a solution was to enclose the pilot in a uh, capsule of some sort. This device, uh, which never saw operation, uh, was nicknamed by Republic engineers the phone booth and it was an attempt to enclose the pilot and encapsulate him in a protective cocoon as he left the airplane. The problem with this was the complexity. There were dozens of uh, sequences and series of operations with trip levers and timed uh, devices that had all sorts of mechanical linkage and the uh, possibility of 100% uh, operation of every one of these little pieces of the puzzle every time was uh, uh, suspect at best. This brings us to the KISS principle, which was uh, envisioned by Douglas Aircraft Company Chief Engineer Ed Heineman. And KISS in this case stood for, keep it simple, stupid. The Douglas proposals uh, went in a different direction. They uh, included separating the nose section of the airplane uh, from the rest of the stricken aircraft. And here we see an early version in an uh, RG Smith rendering, but this concept was refined and uh, the capsule was then fitted with stabilizing fins and a drogue parachute, which would enable the capsule to reach lower altitudes, at which point uh, the pilot could eventually uh, manually bail out. That was further refined to a smaller capsule that would eject from the upper part of the airplane, in this case, a Douglas F4D Skyray. This was Douglas's first supersonic jet airplane. The ultimate answer, the Escapac ejection seat. The Escapac system was used in all the Navy uh, Douglas aircraft with great success. And it uh, was really a good embodiment of the concept, less is more. An airplane that did have a crew capsule uh, was the General Dynamics F-111A. Uh, this airplane uh, flew in the mid 1960s. And uh, on January 2nd, 1968, a prototype was undergoing uh, gun testing at Edwards Air Force Base. The uh, airplane was originally outfitted with a 20 millimeter M61 Gatling gun. After a series of strafing runs, the uh, gun pod area uh, uh, caught fire and the nose of the airplane started to burn. Uh, the airplane lost control. Pilots Colonel Henry Brown and Lieutenant Colonel Joe Jordan, holder of the world speed record in the F-104, by the way, ejected the capsule at 5,000 feet. They landed successfully, even though the capsule rolled over uh, 360 degrees when it hit the ground, but it thankfully landed upright. And here we see uh, Brown and Jordan after the ejection. And this became the first operational use of a crew escape capsule with successful results. An airplane that did not have successful results, the B-1A, the original uh, concept of the airplane envisioned in the Carter administration on August 29th, 1984, the second prototype of the B-1A was undergoing aft CG fuel transfer tests at Edwards Air Force Base, and the airplane pitched up to 70 degrees 
uh, and spun out of control at 4,000 feet. The capsule was ejected at 1,500 feet. And here we see the second prototype. Uh, at that low altitude, uh, the capsule did not have a chance to stabilize. And instead of landing flat, as it was intended, it uh, landed at an angle impacting on the right front corner. Uh, three of the crewmen were injured. The fourth was Rockwell Chief Pilot Thomas Doug Benefeld, who uh, sadly did not survive the landing of the capsule. Later versions, the B-1B uh, the program was resurrected under the Reagan administration, uh, were fitted with uh, four separate ACES-2 ejection seats as the airplane is configured to this day. So that brings us to the concept of separating the entire nose section from the airplane. How did that actually work? Well, the first airplane to have that feature was the Douglas D558-2 Skyrocket, a, originally a jet and then a jet rocket hybrid and eventually a, a rocket powered research aircraft. The idea was that the pilot would have a series of options. If the airplane was low and slow enough, he could uh, jettison the canopy and manually bail out. If the airplane was flying at high speed and high altitude, he could separate the nose section from the fuselage, uh, eject the seat back, and then fall out the back of the capsule. You'll notice that there's no drogue chute or stabilizing fins in this rendering, and that makes you wonder uh, how the capsule would have been stabilized. But thankfully, the uh, Skyrocket made a total of 317 flights. It became the first airplane to fly at Mach 2 in 1953, and all three aircraft survived. An airplane that did use an escape capsule in an actual emergency was the Bell X-2. This was a research aircraft that was envisioned in the late 1940s. It was a problematic uh, flight test program. Uh, the airplane didn't achieve its design goals until the very last year of a 10-year program in 1956. The X-2 was fitted with an escape capsule. Here we can see the uh, break where the capsule would separate from the fuselage. And in this study, we see the capsule on a test stand. And uh, let's take a look at the back of the capsule. Here we see all the couplings and connections for the instrumentation, as well as the four explosive bolts that would fire it away from the X-2's fuselage. These bolts are at the 10, 2, 4, and 8 o'clock positions on the main fuselage. The drag chute, which you see deployed here in the uh, shop, uh, actually the bell hanger, uh, were stored in the cavities that you see in the center of the capsule. As mentioned, the X-2 was a late 1940s test program, and this cockpit reflects that design uh, methodology. Uh, you see the basic instrumentation, uh, a gyro horizon, just very, very simple instruments for an airplane that was uh, exotic and designed to fly at Mach 3. Compare this to the third and most advanced version of the X-15. Uh, this airplane flew five years later than the X-2 but uh, the instrumentation is quite a bit more advanced. And the reason I mention this is that this instrumentation issue was a factor in the loss of the second X-2 on its first flight to Mach 3. The last two pilots assigned to the X-2 program were Captain Ivan Kinchlow, seen on the ladder, and Captain Mel Apt, seen seated in the cockpit. On 27 September, 1956, Apt launched in the X-2, uh, taken to altitude by the mothership, the EB-50, piloted by uh, Fitz Fulton. And here we see the actual launch of Melap's flight. We were able to deduce this from the sun angle and the markings on the X-2, which reflect the very end of the, its uh, flight test program, the last flight. He launched over Rosamond, California at uh, 35,000 feet and accelerated climbing to 70,000 feet flying on his very first time in a rocket-powered airplane, a perfect profile. What this meant is that he had 15 seconds of extra fuel burn, which propelled him to a speed of Mach 3.2. The problem was the instrumentation, which was lagging. So App did not know how fast he was going at that point. He had 26 seconds of stable flight at that speed and was uh, perceiving the fact that he was uh, rocketing away from Edwards at an alarming rate and would not have enough uh, range to make it back to the lake bed. So uh, after 26 seconds of stable flight, he turned the X-2 to the right 
and the airplane departed control flight went into a series of wild inertia coupling gyrations, subjecting Ap to uh, just inhumane levels of positive and negative G. He was able to recover in the mid, uh, mid 30,000 foot range, jettisoned the canopy uh, and the capsule, I apologize. Uh, the main part of the fuselage, uh, as it entered thicker air in the 20,000 foot area, uh, entered a series of skip glides. This is a stall glide stall cycle. The airplane impacted the desert uh, about five miles south of Highway 58 and just east of Highway 395 in the Mojave Desert. The capsule uh, plummeted to earth as uh, Apt was attempting to make the manual bailout and impacted the desert at 120 miles an hour and Apt did not survive. So what about the concept of the capsule leaving the front of the airplane and the pilot being exposed? A solution was to enclose the pilot. The first airplane to embrace this technology was the stillborn Republic XF-103 Thunder Warrior, a all titanium Mach 3 concept uh, that never made it past the mock-up stage. But I mentioned this airplane because it contained an escape system that allowed the pilot to fly in shirt sleeve comfort, literally, and here we see uh, Republic test pilot Hank Cressabine sitting in what was affectionately referred to as the shoe. You can see this is a uh, very complicated, uh, uh, cumbersome type of a, a system uh, if it had ever been uh, used in the airplane. But the solution came three years later in this aircraft, the Convair B-58 Hustler. The B-58 was the first aircraft to contain crew escape pods, as you see here. These pods were tested on rocket sleds and eventually in uh, live ejections in the airplane using sedated uh, black bears as test subjects so that the flight surgeons could study the effects of the ejections. And uh, these animals survived these tests. Here we see a ground test at Edwards and an aerial test as well. The last step was to have human subjects test the capsule, which was done. Uh, although he looked, uh, as you see here, like uh, astronaut Gus Grissom, this is actual uh, Navy Chief Warrant Officer Edward J. Murray, who uh, was a parachute expert, and he tested these capsules. You see him here being assisted by capsule tech William B. Powell. But the next step in the uh, evolution of the man bomber was the B-70. This was a Mach 3 aircraft that could fly as high as 70,000 feet. The original concept uh, seen here in this Bob McCall rendering uh, actually came to fruition. Uh, the cockpit looked like this on the actual airplane, but the B-70 first flew in September of 1964, a very advanced machine and the largest airplane ever to fly at Mach 3. This airplane was fitted with two crew escape capsules. Here we see what the capsule looks like in the cockpit. Uh, this photo was taken at the Air Force Museum uh, this is uh, Air Force Project Pilot Joe Cotton in 2003, and uh, Air Force Staff Sergeant Tony Accurso and myself were allowed to enter the airplane uh, using a cherry picker, and we were able to get these photographs. But I wanted to show you what the escape pod looked like in the uh, in-flight position with the upper and lower doors in the open uh, position. This is the escape capsule itself. You see the seat is uh, in the uh, piloting position. The seat would actually retract back and down into the capsule uh, as it was ready to eject with the doors shut. This is a static ejection test of the B-70 capsule. And on the morning of June 8th, 1966, uh, test pilot Fitz Fulton, seen on the right in this photo, was assigned to fly the B-70 on a test flight uh, Colonel Cotton is seen here in uh, younger days uh, to the left. But at the last minute, uh, Colonel Fulton was asked to fly a B-52 to launch an X-15 mission. And so substituting for Fulton on that B-70 flight was Chief North American test pilot Al White, seen here to the right with Colonel Cotton. Also on this mission, the co-pilot was Major Carl Cross, the next Air Force pilot assigned to the program. This was to be his first checkout. As the B-70 launched, ironically, the X-15 mission that Fitz Fulton was to fly was canceled. But the B-70 was already in the air and was conducting a series of tests, including sonic boom and airspeed calibration. And I mention this for a very important reason. I read way too often that the uh, B-70 was assigned a photo shoot 
which it was, but the photo shoot for General Electric, which included other aircraft powered by GE engines and was to be used for a General Electric calendar, was added to a scheduled Air Force flight test mission for the B-70. Piloting the NASA F-104 in that formation was Chief NASA test pilot Joe Walker. Walker had flown the X-15 to its highest altitude, 354,000 feet. The other airplanes in that formation were uh, a F-4 Phantom from Point Magoo Naval Test Center, uh, a, the NASA F-104 that you see there with the red tail, a F-5 Northrop F-5 Freedom Fighter from Palmdale, and the T-38 from Edwards. In the rear seat was Colonel Cotton directing the photo shoot and mission. The photo airplane was a Learjet owned oddly enough by uh, Frank Sinatra, but leased to famed aviator Clay Lacey, who piloted the Lear for this mission with the photographers on board. Seconds after this uh, formation cleared the cloud bank uh, on its last final racetrack pattern, the last leg of its last racetrack pattern after holding formation for 45 minutes, this formation moved on into clear blue sky and tragedy struck. And here's what happened. Walker had been using the national insignia on the B-70's fuselage for photo reference and uh, to hold the formation. He had no other way of judging his position, especially the proximity of the T-tail of the F-104 <clears throat> to the wingtip of the B-70. As that last leg of the formation uh, flew on, the 104 approached the wingtip and was sucked into the vortices. And the F-104 then rolled across the top of the B-70 uh, taking off the top third of the right uh, vertical stabilizer and the entire left vertical stabilizer. This is the second after the impact. Uh, Walker was killed instantly, unfortunately, but here we see the B-70. The formation is starting to break apart, as Joe Cotton calls midair, midair. The B-70 flew on uh, in stable flight for 16 seconds until the uh, loss of control, which was inevitable, uh, caused it to enter a uh, snap roll. And in that uh, maneuver, the airplane began to disintegrate. Here we see it entering a flat spin as the wings are disintegrating and the fuel uh, is spilling out. The airplane uh, spun quite rapidly toward the desert 35,000 feet below. Struggling in the cockpit, Al White had caught his elbow in the ejection sequence as the capsule doors were attempting to close. And he finally wrenched it free, was able to eject uh, but Major Cross had been incapacitated in the snap roll and was unable to initiate ejection in his capsule. Uh, as we see here, this would be the proper ejection configuration for the capsule, but because uh, Al White had ejected with the doors partially open, he was able to actually see the B-70 spinning down, uh, but this prevented the uh, impact absorbing gas bag below the capsule to deploy. This was very serious because as the capsule impacted, at a much higher speed and much higher impact, the uh, seat holding White actually gave way, absorbing energy, but protecting him from a 30 G impact. Uh, he was seriously injured, but he did survive. And as mentioned, uh, Cross and Walker did not. It was a tragic day in Edwards history. So what is the solution if you hear these words over an aircraft intercom? Well, let's look at two high-speed airplanes, high-performance airplanes, and how they finally solved that problem. One of these systems was used, one was not, but let's talk about the highest performance jet-powered aircraft ever produced, the Lockheed Blackbird. Here we see the YF-12 interceptor version, and the Blackbird family had an escape system of a Lockheed high-speed, high-performance ejection seat, which uh, separated the man from the airplane and got the pilot out of the aircraft. The rest of that job for survival was the Dave Clark pressure suit that the crew members wore. This protected the crew at high altitude and then parachutes automatically deployed as they reached uh, 15,000 feet and breathable air. Uh, an SR-71 actually uh, disintegrated in flight and the pilots were thrown into the airstream. Uh, one pilot survived the ejection, one did not, uh, but the suit kept him alive until he uh, landed. And uh, it was a very dramatic example of how a seat and suit combination could protect crewmen at very high performance aircraft. The other aircraft to talk about was the rocket powered North American X-15, 
which was also equipped with a high performance ejection seat. Here we see uh, X-15 pilot Joe Engel, the last surviving X-15 pilot today at age 89. And he's sitting in a North American design seat. You can see the stabilizing fin of the seat folded up against the headrest. This is what it looks like deployed. Thankfully in the 199 X-15 flights, no pilot ever ejected from the aircraft. But this slide brings us to part three of this series, which will be rocket sleds. And we will broadcast this episode later this summer. So there you have it, a look at capsules and pods and the role they played in uh, uh, survivability of uh, pilots of high performance aircraft. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. And as always, we'd like to thank uh, the special people and the entities that allow us to uh, bring you these presentations and supply the photos and information. NASA test pilots, Don Malik and Fitz Fulton, my dear friends, Dennis R. Jenkins, Tony Landis and Jay Miller, and the Wings and Air Power Historical Archive, as well as Republic Aviation Corporation and the Douglas Aircraft Company. Thank you for watching. We hope you subscribe to the channel. And until next time, take care.